The past few days, when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hung with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? More prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow is held steady, no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness towards them. Our opening today was from Ronald Reagan. He was reading a speech called City on a Hill, a speech given by a man named John Winthrop. And that's who we're talking about today. But first, here in Canada, it's Thanksgiving Day. So I'm recording this, and then I'm going to be eating some turkey, some mashed potatoes, lots of bread, green bean casserole, and sweet potato casserole. So happy Thanksgiving to everyone here in Canada. I hope that you are celebrating today. We are continuing our series on the Puritans, and today we're talking about a man who has been called the American Nehemiah. We're talking about John Winthrop. Welcome to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. We have been covering the story of the church from Jesus Christ all the way until, well, today we're at John Winthrop. If you're just jumping into the podcast today with this episode, I would recommend listening to the episodes that led to this one, especially the episodes 30 Year War. Dutch Golden Age, Adrian Vanderdark, and the Puritans. These four episodes will talk about things that happened during this episode. Events that I talk about briefly, but I go into deeper understanding of them if you listen to those episodes. January 12th, 1588 in England, John Winthrop was born. John's father's family was a rich family, successful in the textile business, and his father was a successful lawyer. John's mother's family were landowners and had many properties. Growing up, John loved to sit and listen to his father and the clergy that would visit his family. They would speak about theology and about the Reformation and the church. John's family was a Puritan family, and they opposed the traditions of the Church of England. John went on to college, and three of his friends at college became men of history. John Cotton became a clergy in New England and one of the most influential preachers. John Wheelwright was also a clergyman, and he established New Hampshire. Sir William Spring of Peckenham became a Puritan MP in Parliament from 1623 to 1629. We can see from these three men that John spent time in college with other young men who were passionate, and that these men wanted to make a difference in the world. During this time, the Puritans were putting a huge push in the universities and in writing books, and John and his friends were the outcome of this. In 1604, John fell in love with a young woman named Mary. They married and had five children, but only three of those children would survive to adulthood. It was a very hard time for John. As a Calvinist, he believed that everything that happened was part of God's will, both good and bad, and to lose three small children was very difficult. John followed in his father's footsteps and became a lawyer. He saw law as more than a job. It was a ministry. He believed that everything he did was to further the kingdom of God. Because of that, he took the cases of Puritans who were harassed by the law and often took those cases for no pay. 
Then, in 1615, his wife Mary died giving birth, and the baby died shortly after the birth. John was now a young widower with three young boys, a lawyer fighting for the rights of men who were Puritans. John married again very quickly, as was the custom in that day, to a young woman who was very strict with the young boys, and she really had a high value on being pious. She became pregnant shortly after the marriage. Then just two days after their first year anniversary, she went into labor. She died during the labor, and her baby died shortly after. John had lost another wife and another baby. Two years later, John married again, a woman named Margaret. Margaret's father was a judge, and her brother, a Puritan preacher. At first, Margaret's father was unsure about the marriage. John was not wealthy. He took many cases for free, and the ones that did pay him didn't pay well. And he had three sons who were older children, or young adults really, at the time. But they saw how much John loved Margaret, and they saw, more importantly, how much he loved Jesus Christ. So they agreed to the marriage. In 1620, King Charles came to the throne. People were worried about the English Reformation. We talked about King Charles at length in our last episode, The Puritans. The Church of England was worried that the English Reformation was in danger. In 1626, John Winthrop's son Henry left England to help in the creation of an English settlement in Barbados. John loved that his son was part of this, and when Henry returned, the two spent a lot of time talking about the idea of creating a new England, an England where God was worshipped, an England where the Bible was valued, and the people were governed in freedom. During this time, the Massachusetts Bay Company acquired a royal charter to govern a colony in New England. Then, in 1629, King Charles dissolved Parliament, and the country was on the brink of a civil war. There was a huge crackdown on Puritans. They were thrown out of schools and out of all legal jobs. John lost his job he held at the Court of Wards. He could no longer work, because he was a Puritan. England was changing. Everything was uncertain. The civil war was coming. Lines were being drawn, some on the side of the king, and some on the side of the Parliament. Anyone who claimed to be part of the English Reformation, but did not support the Church of England, was seen as a traitor, and that was the Puritans. The day John lost his job, he wrote this in his journal. If the Lord seeth it will be good for us, he will provide a shelter and a hiding place for us and others. John and Henry became interested at this time in the Massachusetts Bay Company. John wrote a paper calling for other Puritans to come and start a New England. A New England with a foundation on the Holy Bible. A New England that God would use as a light to spread his truth and grace back to England and then to all of Europe. The paper that John wrote was printed and passed around and became very popular. John began to actively recruit people for the New England. He made sure they would have farmers, tradespeople, every kind of people. During this time, his wife Margaret became pregnant. John had lost two wives during childbirth. As the time for them to leave grew closer, John was both excited and nervous. He didn't want to lose his wife or child. John's older adult children were excited to leave with him and start new lives as well. But John asked his older son, John Jr., if he could stay behind and take care of Margaret and the baby. But then, John had to convince Margaret to stay behind. He promised her that she would come just one year later. He would have a home built for her and the baby. John and Margaret came up with a way to stay connected during the year apart. Every Monday and Friday from 5 to 6, they would sit alone somewhere and just think about each other. Think about each other while knowing the other person was sitting alone somewhere thinking about them. In 1630, just shortly before the boat would leave for New England, Margaret gave birth. She survived giving birth and gave birth to a little girl named Anne. John held little Anne as much as he could before leaving, saying goodbye and praying he would see his wife and tiny daughter in one year. April 8, 1630, 11 ships carrying 700 men and children left, heading for the New World. It was either during this voyage or just before this voyage that John gave a speech. It was called A Model of Christian Charity. 
but it has become known in history as the City on a Hill speech. This speech has been quoted by JFK. Reagan used parts of this speech multiple times. Obama has quoted it. Mitt Romney quoted it. Ted Cruz has used it. And most recently, James Comey used it during his testimony in front of the Senate. What was it about this one speech that impacted the people so much that even today it is still used and quoted? Maybe you're thinking you'd like to hear the whole speech. Well, I want to tell you right now about another podcast that I personally love and listen to regularly. It's actually one of the podcasts I like to listen to while I grocery shop, just an FYI. It's called Revived Thoughts. This podcast starts with a brief history of a preacher, and then an entire sermon is recreated. Have you ever thought, I'd love to go back in time and just sit in a church and listen to a great preacher? Well, you can, and with this podcast, Revived Thoughts. And guess what? They have a whole episode dedicated to this speech, or I guess you could say a sermon. I'm going to put a link to this in the episode in the show notes, and I highly recommend listening to it. But for today, the hosts have graciously agreed to allow me to play a portion of that podcast here. So here is part of the speech that Winthrop gave. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah. That is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be united in this work, as if we were one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to forget our desires for the supply of others' necessities. We must conduct business together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and generosity. We must delight in each other. Make others' conditions our own. We should rejoice together, mourn together, labor, and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work. We are members of the same body. So we must keep the unity of the body in the bond of peace. If we do, the Lord will be our God and will delight to dwell with us as his own people. And he will command a blessing upon us in all our ways so that we will see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than we have ever known. We will find that the God of Israel is among us when ten of us will be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, and when he will make us a praise and glory that men will say of succeeding colonies, may the Lord make us like those of New England. For we must consider that we will be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. So that if we deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken and cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we will be made a cautionary tale and a byword throughout the world. We will open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God and all other Christians. We will shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we are consumed out of the good land where we are going. Let us end this sermon with the exhortation of Moses. Moses, the faithful servant of the Lord in his last farewell to Israel, Deuteronomy 30. Beloved, there is now set before us life and death, good and evil. Here we are commanded this day to love the Lord our God and to love one another. We are to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his ordinance and his laws and follow the points of our covenant with him, so that we may live and be multiplied, and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land we are going to possess. But if our hearts turn away, so that we do not obey, but are seduced to worship other gods with our pleasure and profits, then it is declared from us this day forward, we will surely perish out of the good land that we are passing over this vast sea to possess. Therefore, let us choose life, that we and our children may live, by obeying his voice and clinging to him. 
for he is our life and our prosperity. The boat landed in June, and the people began to set out to create their colony. But almost immediately, disease broke out, and over 200 people died. Imagine you're standing in a cemetery. There's more new graves today, but as you walk along the paths that have been created, all of the graves are recently new. Sickness has spread quickly, and it attacks everyone, men, women, children. You have only been on this land for a short time, but already you're walking in a large cemetery with hundreds of graves. You stop before you arrive at the newest grave. And you see John Withrop standing there. You want to be respectful. You know this man has lost so much already, more than others. He was close to his son Henry. Henry had an explorer's heart. And you know it was really Henry that excited Winthrop about being part of a colony. And now Henry is gone. You watch for a while and then leave Winthrop alone at the grave of his son. Many families lost fathers, wives, or children during this plague, and it was a hard way to start a new life. With so much grieving going on, some people didn't want to work. Winthrop led by example. He said, there are no servants or masters. Everybody works. And we work hard. And he worked hard to show others there was no task that was beneath him or anyone else. And when it was time to vote for a governor, it was Winthrop that was elected as governor. After a year, Winthrop found himself waiting for a special boat to arrive, with his daughter, Anna, his adult son, John, and his wife. When the boat docked, he watched as people came off the boat, and then he saw Margaret. He hugged her, and then realized something was wrong. While she was excited to see John, there was something wrong. He saw his son, John, and he knew their faces. Anna was not with them. Baby Anna died during the journey. So the reunion with his wife and son John was very emotional. Two years later, more boats arrived, with more people moving into the colony. They came with news from England. William Laud was now the Archbishop of Canterbury. He hated the Puritans and was arresting preachers, throwing them in prison. Puritan churches were all closed and had to meet in secret locations. The Puritan churches were meeting in barns, pubs, forests. And many were fleeing to New England. Among those who fled to New England was a woman named Anne Hutchinson. And we're going to talk about her in the next episode. William was the governor, so he had to deal with the problems and complexity of setting up this colony. One of the complexities was dealing with the native tribes. Each tribe was different, and tribes had treaties with each others. They also had rivals and wars between each others. Wilthrop believed that the natives were, in fact, people created by God, and they were to be treated with respect and with civil diplomacy. They began to trade with different tribes. But one day, a man named John Stone and seven of his men were killed by a tribe called the Pequots. The Pequots mistook John Stone for a Dutchman and thought that they were killing Dutchmen, not Englishmen. The Pequots were at war with the Dutch. You can learn more about why that was in the episode Adrian Vanderdonk. While the English didn't attack the Pequots in retaliation, this act did cause a huge rift and a lot of distrust. Then, in 1635, a hurricane hit the area. All the crops were destroyed. A famine hit the area, and both the English and the Pequots were starving. This added to the problem. Then a traitor named John Orderman was killed. His whole crew was killed, and his boat was looted by the Pequots. The murder of this man and his crew became the topic of sermons in pulpits across the area, and it was really just a perfect storm. Englishmen began raiding the Pequots' tribes in revenge. The Pequots then asked other tribes to join them to fight the English. While all of this was going on, a university was started in New England. Harvard University. It was founded as a school that would train the young men to love God, preach the word of God, and know the law. That same year, in 1637, civil war broke out between the Pequots and the English. The English won the war, and the Pequot tribe was spread out and was no longer a tribe. The English had captured warriors during the war, 
and in 1638, one year later, they sent out a ship full of Pequots called Desire. This ship, full of the captured warriors, was traded for African slaves. Some people use this as an attack on John Winthrop, but although he was the governor of the colony, he had no control over the Massachusetts Company, and they were the ones that entered into the slave trade. However, John Winthrop kept three of the natives as his personal slaves, one male and two females. However, we do not know the reason for this. Did he keep them as slaves, or did he keep them to make sure they would not be separated and sold into slavery? We don't know, but what we do know is that three stayed with him. Margaret and John had two children during this time. In 1641, John helped write the Massachusetts Bodies of Liberties. This gave people the right to trial by jury, free elections, free men were allowed to own property, no cruel or unusual punishment was allowed, government couldn't seize your property, and no forced self-incrimination during trials. But they also needed to address slavery. Slavery had been brought to Massachusetts before Winthrop had arrived. Samuel Maverick had brought slavery over in 1624. In the Body of Liberties, this is what they wrote. There shall never be any bond slavery, village or captives among us, unless it be lawful captive, taken in a just war, with such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. So, it was anti-slavery with exceptions. Today, we just see this as being pro-slavery. There can't be any exceptions to slavery. We can't be anti-slavery with exceptions. You're either pro-slavery or against it. Now, we see that today. Before we judge, think about the issue the church has laying before them today. I am a pro-life advocate, and what I hear often when I talk to people, especially Christians, is that many of them are pro-life with exceptions. Rape, life of the mother is at risk, extreme disability for the child, incest. But can you be anti-abortion with exceptions? I believe that the men putting together this body of liberties thought that saying they shall never be any bond slavery, village, or captives among us they were doing a good thing. But when they added the word unless, followed by exceptions, they went down in history as being pro-slavery. At the same time, it is inaccurate to say that they created slavery. Slavery was always part of the history of the world. Instead, what we can see is that right from the start, slavery was a controversy. We're going to hit on this topic many, many, many more times over the next couple of weeks, really the next couple of months, the church was going to need to deal with this issue and take a stand, with no exceptions. Had John not added the unless to the Body of Liberties, the Body of Liberties would have gone down in history as probably the most amazing piece of writing ever. A few years after this was written, June 14, 1647, Margaret died. Now a widow once again, John married one more time. This time it was another widow. A friend of his named Thomas had died, and a widow alone in this new world needed to have a husband. So John married her. And two years after he married her, John died of natural causes. On the 26th of March, 1649. And that is our story of John Winthrop. There are so many lessons that we can learn from his life. And there's so many lessons that can be learned from many of the Puritans' life. And next week we're going to dive into a few more of those stories. In the meantime, for Canadians, happy Thanksgiving. And for everyone else, I'll see you next week. In the meantime, if you want to hear more podcasts, blogs, or lots of videos, including, by the way, my video series on the abortion debate, you can check out my website, lauraleesiemens.com. I'll see you next week.